All right, we're here for our next edition of the Horse Woman's Voice, January 11th. I got to say, Steve Searle hit the nail on the head. Women are important in this business, and we wouldn't have much if they weren't with us. We've got uh, two really interesting Marshall interviews this week, as well as a woman that's working with the youth. Well, let's first start with Missy. Missy Rothfuss, you there? Yeah, Eric, I'm here. Thanks for having me. No worries. Where are you at? I am actually outside my bar, barn on the car phone because I have to feed dinner to the, for the horses. Wow. So it's just nonstop. We talked before you know, we started this interview. Your days just run. We were going to talk a couple hours ago. Obviously, we got postponed. What is a typical day for you just as a horsewoman? You know, not, not just, I guess, as just a marshal or an outrider, but just a typical day in the life of Missy. Um, a typical day, we get up, uh, me and my husband, Jim Rossis, we have a small racehorse stable, and we get up, we get those guys go, get them out, and then I start doing, I have a, um, four finished out riding horses right now, and then I have a new one, a fifth one I just picked up, so I get them work, or turn them out, it depends on the day, it depends on the weather, it depends if I'm tired, and then usually post times at 12, 45 now, so we're hustling. Like, we're up early, we're going all day. After we're done at the barn, I go out ride till about 5.30, and then we feed dinner, go home, eat dinner ourselves, go to bed, and start it all over again. So, I guess, how many days a week right now are you out riding? Um, it was four, we're down to three until April, I think it is. Okay. So, now that, like, we've been down, I picked up um, some new clients. I have been Horse shopping for them and giving their daughters riding lessons. So I've been doing that on the side now too. So you work with clients, like you were telling me earlier. You know, due to the delay, you had a client yeah. that basically bought a farm and they're looking to get a couple head to basically, I guess, what with their children. For, yeah, for their children, they were um, they bought a farm. Their girls love horses, and the guy that owned the previous owner hooked me up with them, and he told them that, you know, he, I'm one of the best riders he knows to get with me. So I've been, I already found them two, three horses. Wow. We're working on a fourth. Um, I just had lessons today. That was what held us up because I left my phone in the barn because I was helping them. But I go out there a couple times a week and help them. And I have an assistant, um, Savannah Bedard. She comes with me. She helps. She rides some of my outriding horses for me. She exercises them some days of the week when I get too busy. Gotcha. And she was actually one of my original students when she was nine. She's 16 now. Wow. Let's jump right in. I, I, I see there's a bay, there's a chestnut, but there's this palomino that you were telling me before we started talking. You were talking about obviously finding horses for people, but there's a special story behind this palomino? Um, the palomino, that's Dude. Um, Dude came from a kill pen. He was 500 bucks. He was on Facebook, one of those bleeding heart sites, please save me. And I, a lot of my horses, even before it was cool to buy from a kill pen or buy from a sale like that, a lot of my horses always came from there. Growing up, that's all we used to do. My mom and my aunt would take us to the Wingford auction. We'd pick out, bring home a couple horses. They'd throw me on, ride them. We'd work them, and then we'd resell them. And that was just what I know, I'm good with a problem horse. Now give me a $20,000 well-broke horse, it won't do nothing for me. I've been there, done that. <laughs> it won't work for me. But you can give me a $500 reject and I'll make it a gold mine. Wow. So let's go to the bay and let's start looking at some of these action shots. You've been in social media lately with some loose horses. Um, let's talk about the bay. Um, the bay, Salem, I've had him. He's... 25. I've had him since a three-year-old. I broke him out myself. And in the beginning, it took him a while to grow up, and I absolutely hated him in the beginning. He was immature. He's a very strong-willed horse. You're not going to tell him what to do. And then it was like he turned about eight or nine, and it clicked in his brain that this is what he likes to do, and he started working really good. Well, then about, I think it was 10 years ago, he foundered on me. And the vets told me to put him down. He'll not even be a pasture pet. He won't be anything. Won't even be, you know, nothing. And, he, I and here you are 13 years later, and he's still riding him. <laughs> <laughs> he's still riding. He still runs it. I mean, last year at this time, he ran a horse with a broken line in a race 
down from behind. Like, he's, he's 24 years old and foundered. He shouldn't do this, but you you never know unless you look at his feet. Wow. He doesn't look it. He doesn't ask it. He's, he's actually my toughest horse to ride. So is he your primary horse that you're using when you're out there, or do you share, I, I guess, have, between? I, have, I use one horse a day. I have four horses right now. I have Salem, dude. I have a little paint I just picked up in July out of a sale. Tito, who made an amazing catch with uh, Jasmine Arnold at Jug Week. Yep. And that was his, he didn't even know what he's doing. He's just out there like, oh, I'm going fast. And, you know, he's turned out, he, that horse is too smart. Like, he's so smart. I call him my mini Salem, though. So the, the horse that you're referencing was the horse that blew up on social media with Jazz when she caught that yep. horse. I mean, what was, I guess, if we can do this, I, I know you don't want to say this, but what was your first marshalling experience on a track? Um, my first marshalling experience wasn't like this. Um, I had a loose horse. I had a very bad um, garbage horse. He was so bad that, like, if a horse would stop and want to go, he'd stop and want to go near him. <laughs> so I was, I'm, I'm a very gutsy rider, like, I swell up. When things go wrong, I'm better when things go wrong. When things are, like, nothing's going on, I'm my own worst enemy then. But when things are wrong, I don't even think about it. I just do it. I had a loose horse, and I caught the horse. I'm like, yeah, off the bad horse. And I'm like, yeah, I caught this horse. I'm all excited. And while the bike shaft was broke, it smashed him in the cycle, and he started bucking, and away I sailed right head first into the winter circle. Do we have video? I mean, can we get a copy of this? I mean, it was an embarrassing moment, but I'm just kidding. What? I'm just kidding. Let's move on to the let's move on to the chestnut. You say that you train horses all the time. There's a shot here of a chestnut in a parking lot. Is he ready to go on track, or are you still training him? I know you want to move on, but that was on tape, and I'm sad I didn't get. I don't want to put it. I don't want anybody to find it. Come on. <laughs> Because you know what? A lot of these outriders beat themselves up too much when things go wrong. And you can't, like, you can only do what you can do. What do you mean beat up? Like, you just beat yourselves up in your head or just what? Beat yourself up in your head like, oh, I could have did better. I missed that horse. But you're not going to catch every horse. So you're always That's critiquing what, yourself is what you're saying. We're always critiquing. We're the hardest people on ourselves. And then there, unfortunately, I mean, this is going to sound bad. There's some horsemen that are really nasty when things go wrong. Wow. And a lot of these young girls. I feel bad for it because some of these horsemen are like, well, so-and-so could have got it. Yeah, well, okay, me and Salem been doing it for 20 years. We could do it in our sleep. You wow. know, when you learn, you're going to mess up. I still mess up. I fall all the time. I still mess up. I'm going to give a shout-out to Sis. I mean, she had Chubby on the network here, you know, here in Chicago, and Chubby was the best. I mean, everybody knew Chubby. So you're oh, saying yeah. he's like that type of horse. He's yeah, Sis has one of my horses that I couldn't get along with, uh, Blackie. That's one of, oh, oh, that horse hated me. I hated him, but wow. loved it. I mean, it's just, that's how it goes. It's just, it's like horse racing, you know, and it, it's a tough job and nobody well, ever Well, you know, this could be another angle and this could get interesting. You know, Sis is a Pisces. I'm a Pisces on the cusp. Can I ask yeah. what star sign you are or when your birthday is without the year? I'm a Sagittarius. So you're a horsewoman, literally. Yeah. I'm literally a horsewoman, but there's certain horses i do not get thoroughbreds i have never gone along with a thoroughbred interesting In fact, that red horse that you were referencing that's a thoroughbred tia schaefer who is amazing with thoroughbreds she gets these things off the track breaks them she makes them look so good i'm like oh i can do that i know how to break horses i'm gonna get a thoroughbred yeah that lasts for like two weeks and i'm like i don't want this horse anymore please take it away from me wow I just can't get along with that breed. I don't know if it's, it's a lot of patience. Like Tia says, I just don't click. I, I think, is Tia a Pisces? See what I mean? And it's like older spirits get along with older spirits. Most horses are bred to be full January, February, March. You know, some yeah. go into April, some might go into May, but people don't realize that astrology actually plays a key. And that's now what you I, do. People can go to U.S. Trotting, the infamous regulatory agency that is a, I guess, what? <laughs> they just hold information. 
That, that's all they're known for. So, you know, people can go to Horse Tattoo Search and just type in a name and find that information for free. You don't have to give them your money all the time. So, let's just do like a, a little, I guess, I don't know, a scenario here, okay? You're on the you're on the wire. You're just, you know, up on the apron. You're talking to some patrons, what have you, smiling, people taking pictures. Boom. You got a loose horse on a three quarters. You got to come around. What do you do? Um, if I set the meadows and it's set the three quarters and I'm talking to people that I never, and every everybody knows if I'm talking to you, I'm not watching you. I don't look at you. I'm watching the race. It's depending on which way the horse I evaluate which way the horse is going to go. But the horse is behind you. You're on the wire. So do you turn and go back, or do you come around the first turn and swing around so you've got well, that angle? It depends. Again, it depends where the horse is, which way the horse is going. If he's behind me, if he's turned around and gone the other way, because if we're going at the meadows where I ride, if I'm at the wire, the three-quarters are straight across the ditch, so, or the big gully. So if he's coming around behind me, I would swing into the infield, or not the infield, inside the hut, pylons, cut uh -huh. off time to swing back out and try to grab him that way. Now if he's behind, if he's coming with the race, I would go down into the, inside the pylon and then try to and set up to wait for him to come to me. Okay, so now you've come up to the horse. Yeah. Okay, so we know... There's the bit loop, and there's a, there's a bridle. Who knows if it's open, if it's closed, if there's a shadow roll. You know, what do you do when you actually get up to the horse? How do you actually latch on? Is it a finger, two fingers? What do you do? Are you talking to the driver? You know, it's let's let's just boom, intense. Right now, you know, you got to do it. What's happening? Yeah. What's going through your mind? It's focusing on the horse and still surveying everything that's going around me because I've had times I've been out there like they do have a roll now. Well, they did. Nobody's allowed on the track if there's a wreck because I've almost run people over because I'm not looking for you. I'm looking at that loose horse. Wow. And luckily, my horse paid attention and shied, and I'm beating him because I'm mad at him because you don't shy. You know better. I'm, like, cracking him with my leg and everything, and I look, and there was a lady there, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Like, I was going to kill her. But I look at the horse. I, I am one, too, and I learn from experience. I do not hurry up and grab. You get yanked off that way. I let the horse, my horse, get up there. If the horse isn't shying, you know, they're all going to shy from you a little bit. I kind of let my horse get up. I reach over. I grab. I do have a habit of putting two fingers in the bit to pull back. I don't know why I do that. It's just always been a habit of mine. Everybody catches different. And it depends what you have. Like with Chris Shaw, when I had, I didn't, when he had the broken line, yep. I put a catch on the side that had the line because I was going to send him into the race. I had to go on the side that didn't have the line, and I had to use the overcheck to pull the horse up. Wow. So everything you have to, like, play out quick in your mind. Like, everybody's, oh, you got to catch the horse quick. No, you got to be smart and look. If I go here, you know, you got to be able to think on your feet. If I do this, like, if I would have went in on Chris with the broken, you know, with the broken line, I would have sent him right into the, uh, the race and took out everybody. Wow. So, you know, yeah, I had to reroute, and I had to come from behind, and then I had to use the overcheck. You know, what's nice is Chris is very laid back, so we work together. Where sometimes you get drivers, and they're like, oh, my God, help me, help me. And they're screaming your name, and you're like, calm down, calm down. Well, I mean, do they, do they sometimes spook the horse when they scream like that? <laughs> yeah. Um, they do spook the horse, because the horse is natural. A horse feeds off of us. And that's what a lot of people don't, like, when you're scared, the horse is like, oh, my God, what's going on? You know, and it doesn't spook my horses because mine have been taught, like, you listen to me, that's it. You don't freak out what the racehorse is doing, what the driver is doing. Like, they listen to me. But, like, I put a lot, a lot of time in on mine to make sure they can handle anything. Wow. And wow. It, it's just. It's different. I it, mean, it's just it's, it's going to be interesting to see. You know, we've got three interviews this week, and we're going to split everybody off individually. You know, later in the week, but it's just going to be really interesting to see what Sherry's perspective is, and let's see what she says when she's running up on a horse. Is there yeah. anybody, I guess, in the industry that you want to give a special shout out to that has, I guess, helped you over the years? Obviously, your parents. You know, was there anybody in particular that you've, I guess, been groomed by that was you know you were a protege from? Um, 
Um, actually, um, back in the day, I learned from drivers. When I started, we were parade marshals. Like, I wasn't even really supposed to catch that horse. I was just, hey, that's, you know, oh, okay. Um, when I took the job over, Georgie Brennan and Brian Sears took me under their wing, Don Ross, as, like, they tortured me out there. Wow. They brought horses. They made me turn. They made me, you know, run them down. But it, it taught me how to do the job. Like, they worked for me. So they worked with me to teach me. But, you know, in the same sense, the better I became, the more I could help them. Exactly. And... I mean, I can remember this one horse, Benedict Casino was his name. This horse pulled me off my horse, not once, but twice. Because he'd rear in the air, and when he'd rear, he'd do it so quick, he'd grip away from you and take you with him. So that's why, like, now I don't touch rears. I'll yell. I'll push my horse into him. I won't touch him because I'm not hitting the track anymore. And I can remember he pulled me off, and I landed on my butt. My horse, like, trotted a couple feet away. And Donnie Rothfuss and Ray Paver come by me, and they're like, get up, get up, you're embarrassing us, get up. <laughs> wow. and, I, and I mean, some of the stuff I've been through, I, I should still be doing it 25 years later, because I, I mean, but that's the thing, you mess up at this job, you're going to hit the track, your horse is going to act like an idiot, you're not going to catch that horse, it's just, it's, you're human. Let me ask you this. I mean, you got me to think. I'm going to ask this to Sherry as well. You know, she marshaled for 30 years. You know, do you yeah. guys, like like Mike Bozich said last week, the announcers share information and critique each other and, you know, share knowledge of the sport. Do you, do you guys do that as well, the fellow marshalers slash outriders? Do you guys? Uh, yes, I do. Um, there's, I am always willing to help anybody. Like, I have horse, I send horses to people. I give, I help people train their, um, Tia Schaefer and me and Cindy Johnson, when she used to ride, we'd always chat back and forth. Like, if we knew that we had a bad horse coming over to the Ohio the race, I text Cindy, hey, this horse, blah, blah, blah. Tia, the other day I had a horse that she ponied in Poconos. And I said, hey, this horse, when I turned him, he folded on me. Did he do that to you? And she's like, yeah, I wish you would have texted me earlier about this horse. She goes, you don't turn him. And, like, so we've always, like, there's a group of us that we kind of, we try to help each other out. You know, we try to, like, keep everybody safe. We complain about stuff that goes wrong out there when we're frustrated. You know, we, we you know, we pick each other up when we're beating ourselves up. So would you say that it's more of like a, a sisterly, fraternity-ish kind of bond between you guys? Because you're just, it's such a niche and it's just such a, I don't want to say underrepresented, but I want to say... You know, it's just, you guys have the most important job on the track. Well, thank you. Because a lot of people, I mean, it's starting to become like, I want to say thanks to Chris Gooden taking pictures of me doing stuff out there has really put out riders like, hey, they're important. We're not just out there to wave and look pretty. We actually have a job that keeps these $100,000 horses you buy safe. That's right. That's right. And, you know, it's starting to become at least tracks now are getting outriders. Like, back when I started, many tracks didn't have outriders. Now tracks are starting to get outriders. They're wanting outriders. They want outriders that can do the job. And, you know, it is a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication to do the job. So it's not like just wearing your uniform in the red, white, and blue and carrying the flag. It's like... This is the down and dirty. You guys are out there. You know, I saw Nat when I was in the infield, and I'm going to bring this up with Sherry. Just the authority that she has on the track when she was down at Oak Grove. Um, it's just the respect for you guys is just second to none. And I really respect what you do out there, and I really appreciate your time. We've gone way over, but you know what? It's been <laughs> worth it. I love the stories. I, I'm sure you have a million more. I look oh, yeah. forward. To, you know, I look forward to maybe tapping into you in the spring, or if something goes down. You know, or not, I don't, not literally, but if something happens, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, get in touch. And if, 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 if there's a loose horse, if, if it's like the loose deuce we had in Maywood, you know, back in the day, or if it's something like it happened with Jazz, you know, I'm, and I'm going to say this to all the Outriders, get in touch. Let's hear what happened. Let's get some pictures. Let's expose what you guys really do. Because, again, I've known, being a third-generation horse person, it, it's scary out there. And, yeah. you know, the respect has to be shown for, you know, what you guys do out there. Oh, thank you. That would be great, actually. Like, a lot, I mean, there, it should be, because there's a lot of young outriders coming up right now. I mean, 
they're, they should be. Like, it shouldn't just be me all the time. That There's a lot of good girls out there and guys that are riding. Well, anybody out there that's listening that knows Missy firsthand or is in this little, I guess, fraternity clique or sorority clique of uh, marshalling and outriding, just get in touch. But, again, we really, really appreciate your time and uh, wish you the best. You too, Eric. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing with Missy, a true horsewoman. We've got another one here. Emily, Emily, hey, you there? Hi, yeah, how are you? Hey, what's going on? Where are you at currently? You you still in Ohio? Um, yeah, so I'm in Ohio, we, um, Salon, Ohio, actually. Um, I do a little training at my house. Um, I drive, obviously, in the, the ladies' pace. Springhaven Farms donated money, and they support us. So... A couple of the pictures you see is me and my um, faithful steed, Delta, Royal Delta. She's been in it since she's been a four-year-old. Well, be my... before we get into everything, you know, what, I guess, is your knowledge of the horseman's voice? Where have you heard about us? Well, I heard you guys like to promote the little guys and get us up there and the grassroots of their harness racing. Um, I've heard a couple of your interviews that you've done with other people, and it's, it's very intriguing and, you know, we need people to promote it, and it's a good way to promote getting a hold of the different people and seeing different views. So we're going to get into the little man Colton, but I guess can I ask directly, what generation horsewoman are you? I'm a first. I took steers and chickens and sheep to the fair. I um, found a note on my door one day that said, free male sterile horse, and I called my friend Bobby Warner, and he said, what is it? And I said, it's a horse. And he said, is it a pacer or a trotter? And I said, it's a horse. And he helped me get started, and that's how my career began, is with a free horse on my door, and off we went. So let's jump into, you were so excited in the beginning of the interview. I guess you got a couple horses here you set at the fairs. One's a bay, one's a gelding. You got some relationships here, what have you? Yeah, um, the one is my favorite. I've had her since she was two. That's Royal Delta. Anybody that knows me knows that horse and how we get along, and she's really good with my son, Colton, too. And the other horse, um, with the white mask on, and Henry Gawley, he's from Michigan. He brought old T-Red down for the fair for me this year to race in the ladies' pace races, and I believe I'm going to, like, probably goof this up, but he's either got 108 or 109 wins. So he's right up there with old Foiled again. Obviously, he doesn't have as much money as Foiled again, but... He's got the heart of a champion. A true war horse. Do you know how yes. old he is? He is 15. Wow. So do yeah. they still allow him to race at the fairs, even though they have the restriction of 14-year-olds with the USTA? Yes, because it's a fair, and um, they can race at the fairs until they're 15. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so we were kind of hoping maybe we would squeeze another air in this year, but um, I don't think we're going to be able to. But, yeah, he loved his job. He was out there. I'm telling you, that horse, he was amazing. He... Anybody could drive that horse. Like, he would be perfect for any beginner kid that wants to get into harness racing to drive because he's just that easy. So you've got a shot here bringing, I guess, your horse to the water next to this tree stump? Yeah, that, um, so we were off at Oak Harbor, and they had a huge, I think it's the Portage River. And I always call it the Chocolate River because it looks, it kind of looks like chocolate. Um... But I just thought it was a really great shot of me and my horse, and she's kind of my heart horse and my favorite horse. So um, the little neighbor girl went with me that day, and she practices photography, and I asked her if she would take a picture, and she was like, yeah, sure. So that's kind of how we got that picture there. Um, just, I don't know, kind of a neat little picture for me, keepsake. And then the next shot, we've got a standard red on her saddle. Is it the same horse? Um, no, that, there's a little interesting story, too. Um we were out shopping for a saddle horse, and we went to new locations. And we found Rio Hanover, that horse there. Um, and they said the people that sent him here want to keep in contact with whoever got him. So I got her phone number, and I called, and it ended up being Sally Bolin. And so now we're great friends. When we go to the Adios, we've got a place to stay. Um, we took him out there so she could see him. And that horse, we trail ride. My little neighbor girl, another little neighbor girl. She uses him for barrels and poles and 4-H shows. 
and then um, we go trail riding and have fun with him. Wow! So you're a horsewoman, jack of all trades, like the rest of the women. Now we've got some we've got some shots here with some kids, and we talked before we uh, started the interview. You're involved with the 4-H. You're involved with the youth, obviously because of your son Colton. But more importantly, I guess what are you doing? I guess with these children and promoting the sport. So with COVID being um, so bad this year and kids couldn't do a whole lot. Um, a little brainstorm I came up with was to have a kids camp, kids day. Our horses are used to little kids, so I put an ad on Facebook and anybody that wanted to come to this kids camp, they could. Well, lo and behold, we had so many kids. We had to end up doing it for the whole weekend. And we had a harness session station set up. We had a barrel station set up, a trail station set up. And then a bath station where they could wash the horses afterwards. And then we told them they could go swimming with the horses. So then we let them, you know, the parents came with them. If the parents wanted to leave, they could. But all the parents stayed. Everybody had a good time. We did a crafts with them. We had hot dogs, cupcakes. Um, we let them go um, wrap the horse's leg. Everybody got to do a harness ride. We had AJ. Um, he come over and helped with the harness part of it. We used our, all of our horses, um, but yeah, just a little camp so they could each touch on different parts of the horses, and some of these kids had never seen a horse or petted a horse or sat in a saddle, but they loved it, and the parents asked when we were doing it again. Wow. Let's talk now, Colton. You know, he's obviously here. It looks like he's, uh, I, I, is he walking the horse out, cooling him out or something at a fair? Yeah, yeah that's, um, my rule is, all the horses that come in our barn have to be safe enough that he can deal with them because he's so involved. Um, after the fair race, we were at Walpop Fair, and he's actually owner on all the horses with me. Um, so he was cooling on his horse and letting her eat some grass. And um, he can actually, besides being a little bit too short, he can harness all of them and actually get it on the right way. And he's told me a few times that I missed something or didn't do it right. But... I just kind of take that with, you know, what it is because it's nice that he pays attention that much that he can actually tell what's going on. Do you, but, have, do you have any funny stories with him? I mean, you were telling me something earlier about hot chocolate or something? Yeah, yeah, that's, it's great. Um, so we started going up to Northville, Michigan, and what all brought this about is he went into the driver's lounge, and they told him that he couldn't be in there because he wasn't a driver. So the next time we went, <laughs> yeah, so the next time we went, he throws on his colors. So he goes in there, and then he's got his colors, so they weren't saying, you know, giggle, giggle. And then we're in um, the shipping barn, and here comes the um, racing commission. And Colton's like, uh-oh, I'm going to get kicked out. He starts walking up to Colton, and he goes, excuse me, are you driving tonight? Because I need you to blow into this. And Colton just looks at me, and the guy's got a smile on his face. And Colton and I said, it's okay, go ahead, go ahead. And he, so he does, and he looks at the little meter thing, whatever he's holding in his hand, and goes, eh, I think you're okay. You didn't blow over on hot chocolate. You're good to drive tonight. <laughs> so he was able to stay in the driver's room and hang with yeah. the guys. Yeah, so he, he was cool. It was, it was really good. It was wow. good. What type of influence are you on Colton? I mean, everybody sees all the crazy pictures and videos you guys are putting out there, just all the fun things that he's doing and day in and day out. I mean, what does he want to be? Does he want to be a driver? Does he want to be a trainer? What are you instilling into this kid? Uh, well, I kind of let him, like, choose his own. Um, he's huge into the harness racing. He, he loves it. Um, I assume maybe he'll be a harness driver, but, I, I mean, I can't ever – I'm not going to pick his future. I'll let him do that himself. He's got a barrel horse. He loves her. But I know um, Josh Sutton, um, Hunter Myers, they've been some pretty big um, influences on him. And Bo Brown, he likes Bo Brown, too. And so, I mean, he's got some really good guys to look up to and help him and direct him. So you've taken him, obviously, to the banquets, and that's where everybody's seeing him yeah. at the national scale. We've got him here in a suit. When was this? Um, that was actually a couple years ago. Um, he got a suit and wanted to wear it and wanted to go someplace fancy. So we take him down there, and it's funny because in between the um, – when they're doing the awards and stuff, he'll go around, and he's got books that he's going and getting everybody's autograph for. But he really doesn't grasp the concept that um, some of these people are – as we would call them, big name trainers and hire people because when he sees them, he just kind of hollers at them just like they're, you know, one of us or, you know, a little guy. And he, he just loves going and meeting all of them. And I know we have 
you know, pictures of him with a lot of the drivers and trainers and autographs, and he doesn't mind going up between the banquet and being like, can I get your autograph? <laughs> but I think they like it, too, because, it's a, you know, it just gives them a good, you know, feel good that here's this little kid. He knows who I am. <laughs> so you were one of the flapper girls at last year's banquet. Oh, yeah. Did you bring him again? Did you bring Colton once again? Yeah, yeah, he actually went. He actually went, and he um, wore his colors. So <laughs> he, this kid, I'm telling you, he wears those colors. So he's like a junior um, celebrity. He's like a, like a Tim yeah. Tetrick on the scene, but for the juniors, right? <laughs> Absolutely, right. I mean, if I, we were out of the Meadowlands. And he had his colors on. There's pictures of him. If you watch, I don't know, through some of this stuff, you'll see him. But he's always got his colors on or always packing his bag. He's always got a, a – his big thing is the whips. He's He loves the whips. And the guys know it. And I remember we were at the Hamiltonian, and he was trying to get Tim Tietrich's whip. And Tim said, I know you. You have enough whips. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's Timmy for you. Yeah, he got whip. He got cut off. But then he sees Josh and Josh. Josh and Tyler all hand him 20 whips because they're like, we're just going to throw them out. They're just trash ones. I'm like, So no, no. can I ask you this? You know, you're talking about the meds and going over all these tracks, Northville, you know, Ohio, what have you. What relationships, I guess, does he have with, I guess, other drivers and trainers' kids? Um, you know, is there anybody the kids, specifically that he's, like, buddy-buddy with that you might yeah, see in, like, 10 um, years him coming into the business with and being, like, you know? Him, he, when we go to Northfield, he goes over to Keith Cash's barn, and him and Kai are really great friends. Um, him and her, they'll sit in their tack room, and they'll watch races, and they get along really, really good. Um, Brooke Nichols, um, her little girl Bryce, and Riley Harmon, they're all about the same age, so they all buddy up and play together, and Lily Haynes, um, he plays with them too, but for him, he's seven, and there's Besides, I guess, the girls, there's not a whole lot of little boys in our area that he gets to play with. But it's but, still, you know, it, this is the grassroots that people don't understand. These relationships get formed at such a young age, and then everybody grows up together, and it's like, you know, this is my childhood friend, but from the business, not from school. And just these relationships, you know, you know this because you've seen it. The relationships these kids are forging now, you know, 10 years from now, they're going to be like best buds. You know that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and like we went to vacation in Florida, and um, Keith Cash and them were down there, and they're like, call us up. We'll go out to eat. We'll go do this, you know. And here you're like, gosh, we only see you at Northfield, but now we're down in Florida, and it's much warmer down here. So what, yeah, you guys just, like, turn the kids out and let them do your thing, and then you guys can just hang out and yeah, relax for a little yeah. bit, I guess? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're, yeah. And then, like, um, Bryce Nichols and Lauren Harmon and Lily Haynes, there's a Moonsville Conservation Club, and they have, like, a riding event over there, and the kids go, and it's an all-day event. And basically the horse, the horses is the babysitter, and we adults just hang out, grill out, cook, eat, and do whatever we want, and the kids take off and play, and... We're all one big old happy family then. Wow. Is there anybody in the industry you want to give a special mm -hmm. shout-out to that's helped you, I guess, in the industry over the years or, you know, just with animals growing up? Anybody just want to say a special thank you to? Um, a big thank you goes to Bobby Warner for getting me started in this and teaching me. Um, Tommy Hope helped me along the way. My dad, he's always been there, and he still supports me. Um, Tim Conkle with Midwest, Re Midwest Harness Report, he's a big, huge supporter um, I do stuff for him in the magazine, and he's a super good guy. Um, that's Walter Haynes. He helps me. Phil Belanger, he helps wait me. Wait now, wait now. You're talking about Junior? Yeah, Junior. I call wow. him Walter. <laughs> wow. So is Colton, is, is your son hanging out with their daughter, Sarah yeah, and, and Junior's Lily. daughter? Yeah, yeah, Lily. Lily. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So that's the, okay, because we know, you know, we know Walter is Junior in the Midwest. I know. I know, I'm sad. I'm no, you're sad. fine. You're fine. It's all about nicknames. It's all about relationships. It's all about grassroots. And, you know, like we were talking earlier with Missy, it's all about the women. And, you know, Emily, we really appreciate your time. And it's just, your insight is just, it's just so different from everybody else. You're involved with the kids. You're, you're coming up with great ideas. You're putting it out there on social media. Do you have any advice for anybody coming up in the business or any of the kids, I guess, coming directly from your voice? Like, um. I guess surround yourself with the people that are going to help you. Um, you cannot do this on your own. Um, like the Junior Haynes, Walter Haynes, um, Jim Mullenix, people like that, um, Bill Blanche, they've been in it so long that they've forgotten more than we'll probably ever learn. Um, get a good start in it if you're going to do it. and Get 
get around the good people because they'll help you. Excellent. Be, hum be humble. Excellent. Well, again, we appreciate your time. We've got another great uh, interview next with Shar. And like I said, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. All right. We had some pretty good conversations once again, and we got the hat trick today. We've got Charlene Sherry Cushing. Sherry, you there? Hi, how are you? I'm doing all right. How's Mitchell doing? No, he's doing pretty good. He's out in Ohio racing right now. Okay. Yeah, we uh, first uh, got our introduction to the Cushings back when uh, Mitch busted his back. We'll get to that later, but I guess what's your history in the sport? You're originally from New York City, I heard? I am. I grew up in New York City, uh, Queens to be exact. Um and was working with riding horses at the time, young at the age of seven, and met different people throughout the industry. And I uh, started going upstate New York on the weekends with some of those, you know, some of those people. And once I started going upstate, it brought me to Monticello Raceway, where, Monticello Raceway, where I met lots of different trainers and drivers. Became a groom at the age of 15. By the time I was 16, I started driving in the amateur races. So you're self-learned, you're first generation. Yes, I am first generation. Oh, wow. So then what was your influence, I guess, in your family? Was it more your mom, your dad? Was it an aunt or uncle? Nobody. Um, it just happened to be local riding horses nearby. And when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a mounted cop <laughs> in New York City. Um, I always knew I wanted to be with horses. And um, I just, luck of the draw, I was able to go and get introduced to, to the stand -the So you were grooming when you were 15, and I guess where did it take you, I guess, to the position of, I guess, marshalling was that at Monticello? Yeah, so I started grooming at 15, driving and training, you know, throughout the years. And 1989, I think, was the first year I started driving and training. And still currently, to this day, I'm still driving and training. Um, and by the time I was 18, I legally I couldn't marshal prior to. Um, at the age of 18, I got the job at Monticello Raceway and started uh, marshalling. I did that for 15 years until I moved to Maine. Wow. So then, I guess, where did you meet Mitchell, I guess, in that time, t you know, timetable or time uh, frame? Actually, it was Michael. Um, I'm sorry, Michael. I, Michael. I, 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 There's so many Cushings in this, in this family. We're going to get we're gonna get to Ron and we're going to get to Mitchell. I promise you on that one. I'm sorry. That's okay. Michael. That's okay. Michael. Michael. Yes. Um, so Mike races in Maine currently. And, you know, off seasons, we only race in Maine probably eight months a year. Um, and on his off season, he would come down to New York and race. And you know, I was marshalling at the time. I also worked in the Lasix Farm. And um, used to pull me some of the sources and just got to know them that way. And that was in about 2002, 2003. But at the time, you were doing your own thing, or were you, like, I guess, sharing yeah. training with somebody? I mean, you just had a couple horses, or? Um, so at the time, um, so from 1989, 90 till 2002, you know, I, I was married once before, and my husband and I had a stable. And then, um, you know, things unfortunately didn't work out. He went on his way, I went on mine, and... Then Mike came into the picture, so I was still had some horses, and I was also still uh, marshalling at the time. But he was originally from Maine, right? Like he's an, an Mike was, yeah. So he would come to New York during the winter meet um, because there was no racing in Maine. So he would bring some of his horses and stable down in New York. Gotcha. So let's talk about the marshalling. Uh, we've got a lot of images here. We were talking about this Absolutely. earlier. Um, we've got a couple horses, multiple images of, of them. I guess, is this a chestnut or a bay horse? So the bay horses that I had, um, you know, marshalling in New York um, and the fairs up here as well. Basically, my job was to, you know, you'll see where I was marshalling horses to the gate, um, whether it was turning horses to the gate, running, to the, running them to the gate, um, helping drivers in need. Um, also, if horses, you know, if there was an accident, my job was to, you know, try to prevent any more injuries and or accidents and try to catch the horses that were running loose. Um, I did that for uh, 15 years, and it was definitely one of my highlights in my life. It's funny. I did a story with Sis Arnold. I don't know if you know who Sis is. Uh, we did a piece on her a long time ago called The Loose Deuce. We had a two-horse that got loose at Maywood, and I did a story on Sis. I saw, actually, Nat, who you know is an outrider up in Minnesota. She was down at uh, Oak Grove. You know, you guys are just honestly, and she knows this. I told this to Nat to her face, and Sis knows this. Probably the most underrated position on the entire racetrack. Can you explain for people that don't understand what's that day-to-day -day grind from, I guess, the morning until, I guess, you're uh, done at the end of the day as a as a marshaller? 
so, you know, it is a day-to-day -day grind. You know, you're getting some green horses brought in. You're teaching them a completely different way of life. You're teaching them to be calm, cool, and collected, and you, be, you and the horse become one. Um, you become a team. So, you know, when accidents happen, you know, your horse has to depend on you, and you have to depend on your horse. If you have to chase a loose horse, you have to make sure that your horse isn't going to dart into another horse or cause more wreck. Um, and the way to teach horses that is, you know, you bring them to the track, you have drivers and trainers come up to you with their horses just to teach them, you know, how to pony. Um, you teach them by when they're going by you, you kind of run up from behind them. You let the bike hit their, you know, their ass end a little bit. Um, sorry to say it that way. Um, but basically it's just teaching them to trust you as a rider. And it, it just definitely is a lot to, to do when it comes to marshalling. And then, you know, when it comes to the race itself or, or during the races, you're, you're out there and, you know, you're out there to help the drivers and protect them, you know, if they have horses that are either running away with them, hot horses, horses that will try to run off the track or won't turn to the gate, you know, they're depending on you. And it, it really is. It means a lot. And, you know, the fact that they have that confidence in you means a lot. I was able to spend a lot of time on the infield at Oak Grove, and I was actually watching Nat most of the time. You know, nothing was really going on when you're standing out in the sun in the middle of an infield. And just the authority that she help, you know, holds on the track. Can you explain for people that don't understand how much responsibility the job really is? There is a lot of responsibility out there. You've got to make sure that, you know, um, I mean, from the, right from the beginning right to the end of the race, you've got to make sure that you, when you go out to do a post parade that, you know, for the public eye, you want to make sure that the horses are in proper order. Um, and, you know, it, you, you kind of watch out to if there's somebody in trouble, you know, you've got to be on your toes to help them in any situation. Sometimes you might just be sitting there and you'll see a horse go up, you know, trying to rear up, not turn. Um, horse get, uh, driver gets unseated, you have to go and, you know, either assist him or, or catch the horse. Um, and then if there's an accident and just say a horse isn't loose and it's just laying on the track and, you know, you have to, and the race isn't over. The race doesn't end. It's still going. So your job as the marshal is to stand in front of that horse to guide those drivers around that horse to make sure that there's no further injury. Um, there's definitely a lot more to it. What about the conversations you guys have? I mean, obviously, if you're pointing up next to a driver, you might have some words. Like, Sis used to tell me some of the conversations they'd have. What do you guys talk about, just from a candid standpoint? Um, sometimes it just might be, you know, how, how things go for the day. But, you know, um, you know, have you driven this horse before? Is, is it a horse that you know? Um, can you, you know, what's going on with the horse? Uh, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of different things. But for most, of the, most of the time, it's just, you know, a conversation, you know, you just verbal conversation that you're having together. So you're just you know, you're just holding them just up on their halter and just looking back and yeah. looking at well, the driver and the by, horses. By the, by the bit and their line, you're holding them. They don't wear a halter in the race. Um, so you're holding them by their bit and or line, and the drivers are, have, a, time, have a, a minute to kind of relax and loosen their arms and, you know, be more prepared for the race. Okay, so pe people that don't understand, they think it's a halter. So let's say it's an open bridle. Where are you actually grabbing onto the horse? Are you actually on the bit on a loop or are you actually on the bridle? No, nope, you're not on the bridle. It's actually the bit loop and or the line that, can, that the driver is holding. So it's the line that's connected to the bit. You're holding that part of the bit um, and line. You're not actually holding the bridle. Gotcha. That gives you that little extra leverage to hold the horse, to pull them either in towards you and to control them because they're controlled by their bit, not by their bridle. So like what, one fingers, two fingers, let's say with your right hand if they're on the left side? You know, it's... It's all, it all depends on the horse you're walking. Some of them are all candidates that just kind of come up to you and they automatically just walk next to you. You almost don't even have to do anything, one finger. Then you have some that get really hot and obnoxious, and you might have to use a little more upper strength and hold them into your, you know, most of the time I would hold them into my horse's neck or into my horse's saddle. Interesting. So let, let's explain this now, you know, in comparison with other, I guess, racing styles, thoroughbreds and quarters why aren't there individual ponies for harness horses? Why is there only that one marshal that's out there? You know, that's a good question. Um, you know, we've only ever had one marshal. Maybe once in a while you might have two, but for the most part it's only one. And it's funny because you have, different than the thoroughbreds, you have the race bike that's connected to the back of the horse. So if something happens in a race and you get a jam um, and you have bikes tangle up and everything, when you go in to catch those horses, it's a lot more than just catching a loose horse. You got them pulling up, you know, pulling metal behind them, and they're they're scared. 
you know, the horse that you're riding, fortunately, I've had some great horses in the past, um, you know, and they have to worry about the bike getting, you know, hitting them. And I've, I've had bikes go up in between me and, and one of the loose horses, wow. but my horses never, never freaked out. I mean, it's, I've been very fortunate. I've gone down a couple of times, but you know what? It's part of the job. Yeah. Well, let's go back, I guess, to the, to the training. I see a ponying shot. But you've got this gray, is it a mare or is it a stud? I can't tell. You're driving? Uh, the one I'm driving or the one I'm riding? Well, I guess the one you're driving, this this, this gray horse. Uh -huh. Yeah, so his name is Air Force Grad. I still have him currently. Um, I've had him for about the last five years. I bought him off of Jackie Rice in New York. Um, and he's basically my, my pet. Um, he's pretty awesome because, you know, when I go out and drive, he's, he's what you will call a little on the bit, he's a little hot. I like horses that tend to be a little hotter. I get along with them better. Um, he's fun because you can leave with them. You can race them from behind. The great thing about him is, you know, um, I've raced him. I can race him anywhere. He, he likes the mud. He likes off tracks. He can go to any, we take them all to fairs, Bangor, Scarborough. I've raced him pretty much throughout Maine. He's just, you know, an all around good little horse. You can ride him, kids jog him. He's just a lot of fun. Let's go back now, um, I guess, to the current day. We've got your current, I guess, ponier or marshalling horse. Looks like a Palomino. Yes. yes, he's a Palomino. He just turned eight. His name is Leo Shady Jack. Um, and he's, you know, he doesn't have the experience as most marshal horses because, you know, at this day and age, I don't marshal near as much as I used to. Um, it's not my day job. But when I have the opportunity to do it, I definitely bring him. Um, so I broke him at farm. I'm currently stabled at Farmington, Maine. And uh, what I do is the same thing I used to do with my old horses. You know, if somebody's out there jogging, I'd go up next to him, pony him, um, come up running from behind him to pretend I was catching them. So he's done really well with all of that. So he's been to multiple fairs. I've brought him to Plain Ridge, and I even brought him back down to New York for my 30th anniversary of marshalling this year, wow. uh, this past year in September. 30 years. How many other people do you think have been marshalling that long? I mean, Sis has been doing it forever, but she's a little younger, but do you think there's anybody else? I don't else know. I'm, doing pretty, it for three decades? I'm pretty up there in age. Wow. So we got the shot here of, uh, of you with uh, Michael, if I could say that correctly, yeah. in his colors. Obviously, he looks a little bit different. He broke his back, and I guess what happened after he broke his back? You made a transition, I guess, in your own life. I, I did. So um, 2008, Michael was in a bad accident at Bangor Raceway, and unfortunately, he went down in a race, tried to avoid a horse that went down in front of him, and just, you know, clipped the wheel, um, got catapulted, landed on his tailbone, and it broke his back in three places. So that kind of changed our way of thinking and, and how are we going to live our future. So, um, you know, Mike being very dedicated and determined to horse racing, he wasn't get, giving it up no matter what. He was back in the back in the bike five weeks later. Wow. Um, yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, his it, it definitely changed him in a, in a lot of different ways. And he doesn't drive much anymore because it, it, nerve endings, unfortunately, was affected. But if he could, he still, still definitely would. But his passion, our passion for horse racing has never left us. But, you know, we also had to think about, well, you know, we do have to make a change. So in 2010, 2011, I decided to go back to school. And at the time, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I just said, you know what, i got to educate myself and have some sort of um, future for us. So 2011, I ended up earning my GED. Mm. Um, and then from there, I took some college courses and decided nursing was the route I was going to go. And, well, I graduated nursing school and became a nurse, and I've been a nurse for two, or a registered nurse for two and a half years. Wow. Well, you know, we were, we were referred to you by Tina Doherty, and everybody knows the Doherty name in this industry. You are truly, yeah. truly something special, I have to say that, from from training and, and grooming and, you know, marshalling and then, you know, things happening with your husband and then going back into nursing and still doing the things that you do today. I, wow. Like I oh, said, thank it, you. It, it, it really is. And, and I'm going to say this to all the women out there, especially all you marshals out there, Jazz Arnold too. I mean, I'm hearing a lot about you guys recently, and I want to promote the hell out of all you people because without you women on that track, especially you marshalers, you can't race. Yeah. You can't race. There, there's, so many, there's so many out there. And, you know, I mean, Jocelyn Gale, She's another one. She's up in Vernon. She does really well as well. Um, there's just so many, so many. Jody Rydell, she doesn't marshal anymore. She was one of the greats. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I don't think that a lot of people really understand what is behind the scenes when it comes to marshalling. And when they say marshal, they're just thinking somebody to look pretty in front of a grandstand and, and the public eye, but it's really a lot more behind it than that. Is there anybody in the industry that you want to give a special shout out to? We have to wrap things up here. We've gone over as usual. Anybody that you know helped you, I guess, through oh, well, the years besides well, your husband. Well, we got Mike. Um, I'd like to bring my daughter into it because you know she helped me throughout the years. She's 21 now. She graduated college at 19. She helped with the horses as well throughout. Um, and now she's running home little business as a baker. She went to culinary school. She's doing great. Um, my cousin Stephen, um, Stephen Wilson, he's doing. I mean, he works with us. We're you know it's a team um, and. He's driving, he's taking on the driving end of it and breaking the colts, and he really, really loves it, and he's doing really well. And he's done the driving end of it for the last year, maybe two years, and he's doing great. Um, a gentleman that works for us, his name is Robbie Gray. He's been with Mike for over 20 years. Wow. He's, you know, without somebody like Robbie Gray, we'd be, we would be lost without him. Well, so, you know. I really, really appreciate your time. We had a great episode once again with Missy, Emily, and yourself. And like I said, we're going to be, we're going to be, we're going to be looking at the cushions, if I could say that. We're going to be relaxing with more of you guys. I'm hearing a lot of things coming out from out east. Uh, you know, like I said, Mike, hope the back's better. And, you know, Ron and Mitchell, we're going to look for you guys in the future because next week we got two father and son duos, and it's going to rock everybody. That's worldwide. awesome. I really appreciate your time. And that's uh, it well, for this you. week's episode of The Horseman's Voice. And I guess just tune in to us next week. And, uh, again, thanks for your time, Sherry. No, well, thank you. Have a great night.